Morning, guys. Happy Friday. We're going to talk about Saudi Arabia today, recording this asynchronously from my panic room. Uh, Saudi Arabia is easily the most important oil producing country in the world. Uh, it is country that I feel best exemplifies some of the themes of this week, um, especially the themes uh, from the first few days uh, of this week. So, you know, what are the Saudis doing to save the environment? Maybe not much. Um, although they are at least thinking about a future without oil. And in fact, it would be pretty silly to think that they wouldn't understand where all of their wealth has come from in a very short period of time. And so to that end, I assigned you a film, um, a recent film that focused more on the political economy of Saudi Arabia than its resource situation. That's always what the sociologist uh, really cares the most about. So today's case study, Saudi Arabia. Let's start with a little history here. The last time the United States experienced a really major gas shortage, that occurred during the OPEC oil embargo of 1973. Um, you, feel free, I mean, most of you at home, you can ask your parents about this, about what, what this was like. Um, the basic backstory here of the 1973 oil uh, um, shortage is that a war had broken out between Israel and some of Israel's Arab neighbors. Uh, and due to the fact that the United States had thrown support, and some European countries as well, um, had thrown support behind the state of Israel in opposition to these Arab uh, uh, countries, OPEC responded with an oil embargo to countries that were supporting uh, Israel. And that included the United States. So overnight, the supply of oil, like where the U.S. was getting it from, just kind of stops. And that means overnight, an economy that is dependent upon oil just for it to function the way that it's supposed to function doesn't have it anymore. So we saw, ma we, I wasn't alive, but uh, the country saw massive lines at gas stations. You can see in this in this uh, picture here, I went searching for this uh, because I wanted one that had this sign here. Do you see where it says even numbers only? That refers to license plates, right? Oil was so sh was in such shortage and was so precious um, that you couldn't just go to the gas station whenever you wanted or whenever you needed gas to go and uh, pick it up and, and, and to fill up your tank. Um, on certain days, it was even numbers. On certain days, it was odd numbers. And all of that was dependent upon the gas station even having gas in the first place. The price of gas just absolutely quadruples. So to put that in uh, today's context, you know, gas is, let's say it's about two twenty-five dollars a gallon. What if all of a sudden it was $10 a gallon? That would have really serious effects on our economy, and it did in the United States as well. The way that the U.S. overcame this in embargo was by developing the long running and still existing uh, relationship with the House of Saud that has long ruled Saudi Arabia. So as a result of a deal that got struck there in the 70s, we started uh, promising defense um, uh, weapons, arms, let me start over, I'm sorry, uh, arms, weapons, and most importantly, defense promise uh, to the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Um, and in return, they promised to always make up oil shortfalls that we might have had uh, within our economy. This allowed us to overcome the OPEC oil embargo. It also made the Saudi regime fabulously rich. And if you may remember, uh, I had showed uh, a couple days ago graphs of some classic rentier states where in 1980, I recall Saudi Arabia getting, I, I want to say about 90% of the state's oil revenue, of the state's revenue entirely was coming from the sale of oil, 90%. Um, and now that's, that's down around 30%, which is still enough to be a rentier state. Um, but it does show you that, you know, they're not as dependent on the singular one resource um, as they were in the past. Um, but that's essentially what happened here. Like we struck a deal with Saudi Arabia and they got fabulously rich by being the new oil supplier for the 
world's core state, the world's hegemonic state. And so the Saudi economy, as a result, was flush with all these petrodollars. And you saw this in the film, in the documentary, where it's talked about how um, for the entire, like many Saudis just were talking about how for their entire lives, they've been hearing, well, we need to move away from oil. We need to move away from oil. Um, well, part of the reason they were so dependent upon oil is they weren't pulling in state revenue from anywhere else. And with all these petrodollars flooding the country, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, I'm going to use that abbreviation today, KSA, that's going to stand for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. They completely dismantled their tax regime. And since then, right, from the 70s onward, Saudis have paid virtually no taxes ever since. So looking at this pie chart here, which those of you, I don't know, there's not many in this class that have taken statistics with me, but uh, if you're out there, you will remember I absolutely despise pie charts. I hate them. Um, but sometimes when I don't want to make my own graph of the Saudi budget, I'm just going to copy and paste what I can from a government report. And so this is, yeah, first quarter 2018. Um, you can see that uh, or the oil sector is 30%. Um, and so if the oil revenue, like if the oil, like if that is what's being relied upon, really more so than anything else to be the linchpin of the Saudi budget. Um, the Saudis are facing down the very same issue that we're facing down and being kind of happy with. We look at cheap gas and say, oh, that's okay. I'm all right with that. In rentier states, that could be, as we have discussed, um, kind of the very survival of their regimes. And that's what I, it's something I want to flesh out today about the uh, future of the Saudi regime. So in 2018, the Saudis looked around and they said, all right, well, the price of oil globally has tanked and it's been in the tank since 2014. So it's several years over in which they've had to run a near permanent deficit, which they're capable of doing, um, but not forever. And so the Saudis, along with some of their Arab and Gulf neighbors, laid for the first time in decades a 5% VAT tax, a VAT tax that stands for value added tax. It's a way of generating revenue on stuff that's already happening. Um, so on goods, on services, a 5% tax. Now, I have often heard that there's only, like there's a saying, a classic uh, uh, saying that there are only two certainties in life death and taxes. In Saudi Arabia, the only certainty is actually death, right? They can't get away from that one. Uh, nobody can, but uh, they could get away from taxes for a long time. Uh, and so for us in the U.S., like we're in almost any other country, we're very conditioned to pay taxes. We see it as a part of life. We see it as a part of living in a complicated society. We look can look around us and say, yeah, all right, nobody necessarily likes paying taxes, but I also like having roads and fire department and public schools and blah, 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 and an army, right? So I don't have to do any of that stuff. Um, you know, it's easy to look at it and say, all right, well, this stuff is important, right? And it's a collective responsibility and therefore we're paying to it. Um, Rontier states don't have that cultural value because they have not had taxation for many, many years. This proved to be really unpopular in the Gulf states and in Saudi Arabia, the Persian Gulf states, that is. And the Saudi dilemma here is pretty easy to see. Global demand for crude oil was really declining. So annual GDP growth, what you're seeing here, like before we looked at the Saudi budget and before we like I'm, I'm before before we looked at the price of oil, what you're seeing here, though, is how GDP is starting to almost permanently uh, fall into a stagnated area within um, the Saudi economy. So because the Saudis specialized exclusively in this one natural resource and most importantly the rent of that natural resource it means they're not producing anything of value it means they're renting something of value to others and if that thing stops being valuable then it's their economy that's at stake the saudi dilemma is that if crude oil uh, demand is declining and there's no sign that it's going to magically turn around with all these other sources and a push towards green energy out there they need to diversify well beyond oil so in just the last year, how have the Saudis responded? Well, keep in mind, this is an absolute monarchy and the will of the monarch is therefore absolute. So the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has responded to this constant stagnated economy by doing 
three things. I have two here, but really three that come to mind now. One, they reduced social spending, which is not popular. Secondly, they tripled that VAT tax, that value added tax, which is also unpopular. A lot of people didn't think it deserved to be there in the first place. And then third, they opened up the country to some pretty unregulated foreign investment. So in the film, it's discussed about how uh, Aram Aramco, Saudi Aramco, uh, was going public, right? They're starting to sell ownership of that outside the, the royal family. That's a need to generate money now by doing an IPO, uh, in an initial public offering. And all of this solves a short-term problem. Right. What does this all mean? You know, again, in the U.S., like I, we look at these political issues and I say, all right, well, the tax rate, it can be here or it can be here. And when the tax rate is in different places, certain things happen, but nothing that can't be undone with policy. Right. If you have high taxes, then, OK, you're going to generate certain revenue, but you might kind of cost yourself some activity in certain parts of the economy. Um, and if you have a very low tax rate, then, OK, you're not going to have money to fund social programs for the poor and the less fortunate. Um, and, and so that will happen but nothing that can't be undone uh, with a change in the tax policy. The Saudi situation is different. The Saudis are doing a lot more than raising taxes at this point. What they are doing is they are introducing something into their society that previously wasn't present. And this is allowing them to solve a short-term problem. They have a stagnated economy that is too dependent upon the pe uh, uh, petrol resources, and they're potentially creating a much bigger one. So I want you to think about here, what, what's the bigger problem that come from raising taxes? Because I promise, I, I'm not coming at this from an uber libertarian standpoint of saying, well, if you raise taxes, you're just like going to, you know, uh, cr crash your own economy. No, no, I don't see that at all. Um, in certain cases, if you raise taxes way too high, then yeah, maybe maybe you can create pro uh, problems. But the problem that the Saudis are introducing here is actually more philosophical. And it comes down to this. They say that these measures are temporary, but I don't, I don't see how they can be temporary. And it's going to fundamentally transform the way that Saudis interact with their government the way that they view their government and the expectations that they have for their government. You ever heard the term beggars can't be choosers? Sure. If somebody is just giving you something, you don't really have the right to demand or to get picky about what it is you're being given, right? If you are not contributing and you're not paying, you know, you take what you can get. And that's kind of the fundamental issue that's baked into the very social contract of rentier states like Saudi Arabia. Once you start charging citizens taxes, you start increasing their expectations for what the government can do for them and will do for them. By charging them Saudis taxes, you're essentially selling ownership of the government itself. And previously, KSA never needed tax revenue from the citizens. And now what we're seeing is that taxes can really empower people to demand more from the government. So I'm going to repeat my big argument here because this is important. When you raise taxes in an area where there haven't been taxes, you are selling accountability off. And an absolute monarchy like Saudi Arabia doesn't want accountability to its citizens. Historically, taxes have often been a spark of democratization, right? The most famous example that we know here is about the American Revolution, right? No taxation without representation, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to draw big conclusions from something that happened in the 1700s. Um, but also in the 20th century, there have been many um, democratization pushes that ultimately came as a direct result of tax policy um, because what it did, it created citizens that ultimately felt like they had the right to request more and to ask for more um, from, their, uh, from their leadership. So historically and in a contemporary way, it can be a spark of democratization. So the Rontier states, what they did, they built a strong social welfare state and they gave it to citizens without asking them to pay anything for it. Remember, beggars can't be choosers, but that's over now. 
If you look at the government, you got nothing coming to you at, at this point, right? The, the the Saudi regime, you could keep everybody under control through a combination of repressive social policy backed by the clerics and the fact that things like education and healthcare were being deeply invested in by the regime, right? No regime stays in power by completely exploiting its citizens, maybe North Korea, but that's one example. Everywhere else, you got to give the people something. And that's over now. That's over now. You're giving the people something and charging them for it. And beyond that, subsidies are also starting to disappear in Saudi Arabia. So subsidies are a little different. They're not quite the direct cause of anything the way that taxes are. There's research that shows that people look at subsidies differently than direct ta taxation, but they also matter here because a subsidy makes a good or a service artificially cheap. In the United States, the most famous thing that we subsidize, well, there are two actually, now I'm just going back in my head. The two most famous things that we subsidize are first, the oil and natural gas industry, right? Fossil fuels, we make gas, gasoline artificially cheap. But the other thing you've likely heard about getting subsidized is the agricultural industry, which keeps the price of... Um, food artificially cheap, um, which is not a bad thing necessarily. It keeps American farmers in business. It keeps our prices at the grocery store um, generally affordable. Direct taxes are different though. Subsidies are essentially negative taxes, right? It's a tax that like, instead of increasing the price of something, lowers the price of something. And so people look at that as part of cost of living as well. Direct taxes are different. You have to actually literally pay something. It's a constant reminder that you and me, we are contributing. And if we're contributing, we should have some type of say in what's happening here. And if we should have some type of say in what's happening here, we have some power as, as citizens collectively. And if we have power of citizens collectively, then all of a sudden, you have the basis for a large-scale social movement. So, turning attention to what the regime has been doing. You remember, there was a lot of purges within the Saudi elite, right? People got put in basically the, if you remember, people got put in basically the most luxurious uh, maximum security prison um, that I've ever seen, you know, until they pledged uh, allegiance to uh, uh, MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of, of Saudi Arabia. I remember looking at that hotel, the fancy Ritz in, in Riyadh, and the fact that, oh, they're, they're under house arrest. Nobody can leave. I remember thinking, yo, if that's what maximum security prison is like, I can't wait to go to jail. Um, except if I ever went to jail in Saudi Arabia, it wouldn't be millionaire's prison. Um, it, it would probably uh, it would probably be a much much harsher prison prison. But I could do that for a month or two, right? The the the, the fancy one, not, not 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 real prison, not poor people's prison in, in Saudi Arabia. So you remember those purges of the elite, and you remember the crackdowns on democracy movement, and and the those women that had led pushes to drive in Saudi Arabia, which for up until 2018 women were legally prohibit were were, pro were legally prohibited from driving um which is something i mean i don't want to get too much into gender here but but it's obvious to see how that is going to really if that that affects women's um geographical mobility within the country it's also going to affect their social mobility within the economy um you know things like getting to work i do you think that the saudi regime really cares that much about women driving I don't buy it. The driving issue, it's a distraction. That is not why those poor people ended up in uh, uh, in prison, right? In, in detention and, and getting tortured. Those people ended up in those situations because the regime saw the power of local social movements um, and the crackdowns are beginning. So I really, I doubt that just a simple tax is gonna trigger massive democratization. If that was going to happen, it could have happened in uh, in 2011 and 2012 when the Arab Spring happened. But still, what this is doing, you the Saudis are very quietly and 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 I don't know exactly how much they see it. I suspect they see it probably even more directly than I can see it, but but I don't know. They won't talk about it. So it's hard to know exactly um, how far their priorities go. Um, but taxation 
it it encourages uh, participation. This one tax is not likely to be the thing that changes everything, but we are seeing the building of a society in which people are starting to think I can contribute and participate more in this. Even China has to consider public sentiment to a degree because the Chinese, the Chinese social contract is a little different. The Chinese social contract is you let us manage the economy and as long as we do that okay, you don't ever talk about voting in democracy. But the Chinese have had to actually go to a type of local democracy where they have elections at local at local levels, right? In villages and towns, right? They do have elected positions. It's just in order to stand for election, you have to be a member of the Chinese uh, Communist Party. So everybody who runs for anything in a Chinese uh, election has already been vetted by the central party. So that's not like, like a free and fair and open election. But the point is they have to have some measure of democracy, right? Because the Chinese aren't giving people things as directly as a rentier state ever did. Did. Even China's got to consider public sentiment when they do anything, um, because it, it's not quite the zero taxation state that that they've they've always had. So what happens next? Well, the Saudi this one way flow of cash from the regime to the people in the form of social welfare, it's existed for decades, and that's the norm. Taxes have existed for only two years. And now I look at KSA, I look at, at bin Salman, and I say, you know, social reforms are starting to happen at a very creeping pace, right? Women couldn't drive, now they can. Uh, music, various types of music were banned. Now you saw in the in the video those men, you know, sitting around smoking cigarettes and having a nice little uh, music circle, right? Having a nice little drum circle. Um, and previously, there were no for, were no movie theaters, cinemas in in Saudi Arabia, and now there are, right? And now, like if you go to Saudi Arabia, they have, um, over the last several years, they've had professional wrestling, like the WWF has events in Saudi Arabia. There have been um, very high um, um, high profile boxing matches. I know just a, just a year ago, I think a year and a half ago, um, there was a, a prize fight between Anthony Joshua, a, um, uh, a British heavyweight boxer and, um, Anthony Ruiz, a, uh, an American, um, heavyweight boxer from, uh, Los Angeles. Um, and I remember I actually watched that fight. Um, I was just sort of interested in the, in, it was, so, Andy Ruiz is kind of like a pudgy Rocky. I don't know if anybody, I, I don't follow boxing very closely. Just if there's a major fight, I'll tune in for that. Um, and, uh, it, it, I, it, Anthony Joshua, uh, uh, got upset pretty seriously by Andy Ruiz at a fight in, um, I think in the United States, I think at the garden, yeah, in New York city, um, which led to this big rematch in which Andy Ruiz showed up 20 pounds overweight and clearly had been partying for too long and, uh, got, got knocked out by, um, Joshua. Anyway, I'm on a tangent here. The point is they bring it like, you know, um, the, the UFC and major boxing matches are, are being held there. Um, you know, they're trying to get the World Cup at some point in the future. Um, so all this foreign investment is coming in. And then Saudi Aramco's IPA, or IPO, of course. Is this a coincidence to you? I, I, don't, I don't think it is. I don't think it is, right? But what the regime is gambling is that they can give away some of these social reforms and do it at a creeping pace and still maintain their absolute control over the wealth sources within um, the economy. So is this a coincidence? Well, I leave it up to you to make that decision. But I personally would, um, I would really doubt it. I would really, really doubt it. Oh, and also, and the other coincidence, um, Saudi Arabia, as you've seen in the film, is having its own citizens who are legal permanent residents of the United States, right? Not a citizen of the U.S., but a legal permanent resident with rights and privileges and protections that should be afforded to that man under the um, uh, agreement uh, under agreements between legal uh, uh, permanent residents and the State Department. Having those, having one of those guys executed and tortured in an Istanbul embassy. And in my opinion, I, I realize that this is just like, it's my sort of personal um, 
opinion here. I, I realized that that you know you could come to your own conclusion. But if you ask me, like, what was the single lowest moment of Trump's presidency? For me, it was the moment in which the CIA and all of America's intelligence agents uh, agencies that had looked at this were utterly convinced that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, on the orders of Mohammed bin Salman, had had a legal permanent, like one of their citizens, but still a legal permanent resident of the United States, executed in Turkey's embassy. In, well, in the Saudi embassy in Turkey. And Trump got up there and said, well, he says, uh, MBS says he didn't do it, so he didn't do it. I thought that was the lowest moment of his presidency. Um, ju just my opinion, but that to me was when, when you're making excuse, like one of our own residents, one of our own, has been killed by a foreign government in a third country that we're all supposed to have good term, be on good terms with. And you side with the summary execution. That was the moment that I, I, I thought, I mean, I, I, I don't like it, it. Honestly, it's a weirdly emotional thing for me to think that way. You know, that that was the, um, you know, not, not that I, not that any government of any foreign country um, will ever care about me <laughs> like ever at all. But, you know, I, I do a lot of international traveling, right? I've been out of the country and God, you know, God willing, I will go out of the country um, again for significant periods of time in the future. And, and when I look at that, I just sort of think like, if I were to be killed um, in a foreign country, right? And my mom, my mother, my sister, and they would never know, um, you know, what, what had really happened to me. Like, I, I guess I, I could see, one percent of myself in the Khashoggi story, just because I talk a lot about social issues, right? I publish things, and I um, and I leave the country a lot. And I thought that was the lowest moment of Trump's presidency, personally. Anyway, um, so the social contract here. Um, this is the challenge for Rontier states, and it's not a one hundred year challenge either. It's a ten year challenge. Many actions of Rontier states are going to have consequences, both intentional and latent, for years to come. And when you mess with the social contract, which the Saudis did, um, you do that without citizen input, the effects can be very, very unpredictable. And so I think what, what you are going to see in Saudi Arabia, you will not see large scale democratization. But I suspect what you will see is a burgeoning democratization movement that operates in the shadows. And the Saudis will be presented with a choice. Do they allow that to operate? Do they crack down even further and, and risk it mutating? That remains to be seen. But in the Arab world, right, people have always looked at the Arab world as the stubborn holdout in, uh, for, demo uh, for democracies. And um, that may not be true anymore. None of these countries are likely to become democratic overnight or even in the near future but they will have movements that will reshape the relationship between individuals, the regime, and the global economy. Thank you so much for listening to me, guys. Appreciate it. Have a great weekend. I'll be back on Monday with another video. Bye-bye.